All right. Well, um, welcome everybody to um, lecture three of the series in functional programming. I assume everybody has gotten their books by now. Um, the discount um, you get is uh, valid until December 31st. So if you don't have the book yet, you know it's probably time to you know order it. Um, so let me put that aside and let's kind of uh, jump right into today's lecture um, about types and classes. So um, you know classes in Haskell are slightly different than classes that we all know and love from you know Java or C Sharp or Visual Basic. Um, but um, I think they are, they are very interesting, so um, you will see what they are. So let's first start with types. So types in a statically typed functional language like Haskell types are very important. And what is a type? Well, a type is really a name for a collection of related values. Um, and that's no different than uh, the notion of a type in any other programming language. So for example, the type of booleans, in Haskell it's called bool, um, describes has two values. Well, really it has more values, we'll, we'll see later. It has the values true and false, and then in Haskell it can also be undefined. You can have a non-terminating value of type bool. But, you know, for now we can kind of, you know, put that aside. So the type of bool um, is, is a set that contains two values, uh, true and false. Um, and why do we want to have types? Well, um, you want to have types such that the compiler can point at errors in your program. For example, if you write, you know, the, the program that we see here, one plus false, well, since one is a number and a false is a boolean, you cannot really add them. So um, the compiler will tell you um, that, you know, there's a type error. And I think, you know, this is a, is a great thing. So I, I, I um, we talked about this before on channel nine, I think static typing is a great thing, um, and sometimes you need dynamic typing, but all the help the compiler can give you to kind of, you know, remove crazy errors or you know, trivial errors like this is, is a great thing. Um, so in Haskell, the way you kind of you know, declare or uh, um, connect a type with an expression is using the notation with the double colon. So if you write E double double colon T, where E is an expression and T is a type, it means that that expression has that type. So in, in the um, case here, you would say false colon equals or colon colon bool. So it means that false has type bool. So that's why how you pronounce the double colon. Um, and it's kind of a little bit like in basic, where in basic, you know, you write, you know, um, expression as type. So instead of double colon, you write the type. In C sharp, it's kind of reverse, you write the type and then the expression or the variable name. So in some sense, Haskell, the syntax is, is more like VB. Now, one of the, the strengths of a lot of functional programming language, and we talked about that uh, last time when we talked about Robin Milner and ML, is that in a functional language, people expect that types are inferred. And this is a process called type inference. Um, and what that means is that you write an expression so you write E, as in the example, and then you know, the compiler will infer what the type is. So you never have to, hardly ever have to write you know, the type of any expression. And we now see that this notion of type inference is making its way into more kind of, you know, mainstream languages. Like F sharp is one example that has quite a powerful type inference, but also C sharp and VB have type inference. When you write a generic method or when you write a lambda expression that you pass as an argument, in most cases you don't have to specify the type because the compiler can figure it out for you. Um, and I think that's kind of, you know, takes away a lot of reasons why people don't like static typing because it's a lot of overhead. You have to type a lot to get your types, but with type inference that all goes away. Okay, so um, type errors are found at compile time in Haskell and they make your code safer and potentially faster because now the compiler can use the knowledge of the static types to optimize your code. Um, and um, so uh, here's like an example when you write not false, that evaluates to true, and then you can ask for its type and then it will tell you that's a boolean. So just like every language, you know, um, there's a base class library of types. So um, 
like in C Sharp or Java or VB and .NET, you have um, types like string, int, double, float, things like that. And similarly, Haskell has a, a number of base types too. Um, they are have bool, character, strings, integers, um, two types. Right? We talked a little bit about that last time. You know, arbitrary precision integers, uh, floating point numbers. Um, one interesting thing is that strings in Haskell are really nothing more than abbreviations for lists of characters. So there's no kind of special string type. It's just an abbreviation, an alias for, for um, a list of strings. And so what is a list? Well, a list is a sequence of values that all have the same types. Very similar to um, what we know in, in um, an object or an oriented language that has generics. So list of T is a list, a sequence of values, all of type T. And the same here. So in, in Haskell you write lists with square brackets. So if you write um, the first example here on the slide, you know, false, the list that contains false, true and false, that has type list of bool. And if I kind of, you know, write a list of characters, you know, A, B, C, D, then I get a list of characters um, and you write that you know, as square brackets um, char. Um, and let's go to the whiteboard here. So in Haskell, one of the um, things that you know, is done in a syntax is that the, the structure of expressions and the structure of types correspond. So it's kind of easy to kind of, you know, see when you look at an expression how the type looks and when you look at the type how the corresponding expression looks. So when we write a list, we use square brackets. So you write, you know, one comma two comma three. Then each of these elements here, well, that's numbers. So say that's type int. And now we have a list of ints. So the type of this guy is list of int. And here you see that we're using the same notation for the type constructor, square brackets, as we use for the value constructor, you know, square brackets as well. Um, and we will see this with other types too, that uh, that's kind of, that convention is used. Um, let me, uh, just looking, ah, there it is. I'm just looking for my eraser. So uh, the type of lists of type T is written, as we see there on the whiteboard, as square brackets with a type. Um, note that the type of a list, you know, it says nothing about the length of the list. That's, that's the same as in um, C Sharp or VB or Java. When you have a, a value of type list of T, you know, it only tells you that it's a list of some length. You know, it might be empty, it might be, you know, like have a thousand elements. The only thing you know that it's a sequence of values of type T. Um, and so that's, you know, we'll see later, there's the notion of tuples, where the length of the tuple is part of the type. Um, the other thing that, you know, shouldn't come as a surprise, um, if you know generics, um, is that you can have lists of arbitrary types. So you don't have to restrict yourself to lists of base types. So here, list of ints. I can have, you know, a list of list of list of um, characters, you know, so this is the type of list of list of list of characters. Um, and then again, how do values look like? Well, I have a list and now I need to have a list. And there I have a list of characters. So here I have like, you know, A, B, C, that's a, a list of characters. And then here I need, to, you know, another list of characters. And now I have a, a list of a list of characters and then I can have a whole list of those. So here you see, again, that is kind of handy that the notation for types and the notation for values has some, some correspondence. Okay, so that's lists. Um, and let me wipe out um, this part here. So the other um, type that Haskell supports and F Sharp supports and a lot of other functional languages support is the notion of tuples. And that's not a type that you see in, in many um, object-oriented languages. So a tuple, let's write a tuple here that has like, you know, a number and a boolean um, and a character. So here I write uh, round brackets um, as opposed to square brackets. And this guy is a tuple which has type int 
bool, and I should write int with a capital, and then char. Okay, so here you see now that a tuple, whereas a list, all the values had the same type, but it could be of arbitrary length. With a tuple, the, you know, the values can be of arbitrary type, or so can be, have different types, but the length is kind of, you know, encoded in the type. So, uh, one way to look at a tuple is a heterogeneous list of a specific length. Um, and, you know, if you have used F-sharp in, in, in .NET, you will uh, recognize uh, the notion of tuple. And the, the, the interesting thing is for when you do a tuple, there's no kind of name here for each element. You know? So you kind of have to, when you want to grab an element of a tuple, you have to do that by position or by pattern matching, as we will see. Um, so that's kind of some, a type that we don't really see in um, many object or in languages. But again, let me point out that just like with lists, the, the structure of the tuple and the structure of its type look very similar. You see, there's the same notation and kind of, you know, and now we just replace the value here with its type, just like you replace the value here by its type, and it looks very similar. All right, so, um, as I said, the type of a tuple enco en encodes its length. Um, so here, you know, there's a tuple of three elements, and we see that in the type. The type has three um, elements. Um, but again, just like lists, the, the elements in the tuple can be of arbitrary type. So I can have here, you know, a tuple, like the second example at the bottom here, like a tuple with true and then a list of strings, uh, of characters, sorry. So now I get a tuple that has a bool and a list of characters. Um, so, so far, um, those are um, type constructors that construct values. Um, so these are kind of static values. Um, of course, we want to do computation. So what, how do we do that? Well, in Haskell, since it's a functional language, we use functions. Um, and a function is like a method. So it's a mapping that takes, you know, some arguments of some type and computes a value of another type. So here are two examples of, of how we write the type of a function. So the first one is not. So not takes a bool and returns a bool. And the other example is digit takes a character and returns a bool that says, you know, whether that digit is, uh, a, whether that character is a digit or not. So in general, the type of a function we write like, you know, um, let's see what they have here, like t1 arrow t2. And so how do we now write the value for a function? Well, again, you know, based on this thing, you would expect that the way you write a function is you write an argument, say x, which is something of type t1, then we write an arrow, and then we write an expression of type t2 in which we can use x. And then um, you write here this slash, which is lambda. So here again, you see that, you know, whenever you write a function, the way you define a value of a function type very closely matches the structure of the type. So this, this is something of type t1. And this is an expression of type t2 that can use the value of x. Okay. So, and of course, in the, when you type uh, Haskell code um, on the keyboard, the arrow is written as, you know, minus greater than. Um, and it would be nice if you could use real arrows, but, you know, Haskell was designed um, before Unicode was popular. And just like with um, all the other types, again, for functions, the argument and the result types here are unrestricted. So T1 here can be, you know, uh, an, a list, and then T2 can be a tuple, or T1 can be another function. Again, so just like in generics, there's no um, uh, restrictions here. So let's look at this function type um, a little bit more, and let's see, you know, what that corresponds to in C-sharp. So in C-sharp, we have um, several types, you know, 
And the type for functions is we have a whole family of function types. So there's func of t, which in Haskell corresponds to something of type unit arrow t. And we have to wait until we talk about monads to kind of see that this is like, you know, not really a, a normal function, but for now that's fine. And let's look at another one, func of s, comma t, that would roughly correspond in Haskell to a function from s to t. And then, which something that we don't have in Haskell, or we have, but it's like, you know, slightly different. So if I have an action of t, that kind of corresponds to something of type t arrow unit. Um, and from a Haskell perspective, something of type t arrow unit is kind of, oops, it's kind of weird. Because, you know, it, it's something that says, given an argument of type t, it returns nothing. Okay, so it's like throwing away the argument. But of course, the whole point of an action is to do some side effect. So that's where, you know, when we talk about monads, we'll see that this is not t arrow unit, but it's t arrow io of unit. Because it says given a t, it performs some side effect, but it doesn't return a real value. And so this is like preparing a little bit for when we talk about monads. So now let's look at two function definitions here on the slide. So the first one takes a pair of integers, so its argument type is int, comma, int, and it returns a new int. So the type is, you know, tuple of int to int, and the definition is add x, y, x plus y. Let's erase this. So when we write a function like this, the compiler infers the type from this. From here it sees that, you know, I'm using addition, so I'm, I'm using numbers, and from here it sees that I'm using a pair. So um, the compiler will infer here that this has type, you know, int, comma, int, and it returns an int. Another way to write this function here is to write it as a real function. You say add, well, that is a function that takes a pair and it adds the two up. So, so these are, you know, two ways to write the same definition. So in, in Haskell you can kind of, you know, move the arguments kind of, you know, back and forth between the lambda on the right hand side and um, to the left of the equal sign there. Um, and so um, we'll, we'll see more syntax like that. Um, now here, if we look at this function add, it takes a pair of, of, of arguments, um, which is not very kind of, you know, Haskellish. In Haskell you would write that function in what we call a curried fashion. So instead of writing, you know, add takes a pair of, of arguments, you pass the arguments separately. So you say add of x and y equals x plus y. In case the type of add becomes the following. It's a function that takes an int and returns a function that takes another int and then returns an int. Okay? So this is what we call a higher order function because it, it kind of takes the arguments one by one. So it takes first this int as an argument, then the second one and then it returns the uh, result of that. So we will see a lot of, of, of types like this um, and uh, it will become clear um, shortly, you know, why this is a, a kind of a handy way of writing functions. Okay, so um, as we see here on the slide, these functions are doing the same, so they're, they're both taking two integers and adding them up but they do that in a very different way. So the first function takes one argument, which is a pair of integers, and returns an integer. The second function, add prime, is a curried function, which takes an integer, returns a function that expects another integer, and then um, returns its value. Okay, so it kind of creates a closure that holds on to that x. So if we write that um, 
slightly differently. We can write that one as follows. We can say add x is lambda y x plus y. Or we can write add equals lambda x lambda y x plus y. And these brackets here are not necessary, I just write them here for clarity. So you see here that, you know, I can write this function here, this current function, in three equivalent ways. Here I'm writing all the arguments to the left of the equal sign. Here I'm pushing the, the y to the right, and here I'm pushing x, both x and y, to the right. And that's a very different function than this guy, which takes a pair and then returns x plus y, whereas here it's a function that takes an x, and returns a function that takes a y and then adds the two. And that's called currying. Okay, so here's another example of a function that takes three arguments. So here the type kind of, you know, already gets um, a, a lot more uh, complicated. So it's a function of type int, arrow int, arrow int, arrow int. So that's a function that takes three arguments and returns an integer, but it doesn't take the three arguments all at the same time, but it takes them um, one by one. Now, it's, we talked in the previous lectures a little bit about syntax, why you know, Haskell takes um, a particular approach to syntax. Well, let's write this type, okay? Int, arrow, int, arrow, int, arrow, int. So first of all, in Haskell, the arrow is right associative. So that means that really the parentheses are like that, right? So we take an int, we return a function that takes an int, which returns a function that takes an int and returns an int. But we don't have to write these parentheses, so we can write this very concisely like this. Now let's write this in C-sharp. So in C-sharp, we would write here, easiest to start here, this is a func from int to int. And now we have a func from int to a func of int to int, and then we here we have a func of int comma. So now you can see, well, in, in C sharp, this type looks kind of you know super complicated, right? There's like you know func 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 and like a lots of um, angle brackets, whereas in Haskell it looks very smooth. It's just like you know int arrow int arrow int. So again, if you're using a lot of higher order functions, as I said, you want to, to um, give the operator that you use most the kind of least you know, amount of noise, of syntactic noise. So in Haskell, since it's a functional language, we're using the function um, type a lot. So it's kind of heavily optimized, the syntax is heavily optimized to write these function types, and that's when you see what you see when you compare that to the equivalent uh, C sharp code. Okay, so I, I I said why are we using this curried functions? Why are we doing this complicated thing of functions that return functions? Well, the thing is that you can do something that is called partially applying. So when you have a function like this, you like let's call this thing f. You can apply this thing to another argument, so I can say, I can do f of 5, I give it the first argument, so the result of this is something that takes an int and another int and returns an int. So I've kind of created a closure that has captures the captured the first argument. And you can do that the same in C-sharp. But in Haskell, again, because it's so lightweight, this is what you often do. You kind of, you know, take a, a function that's curried and you apply it um, with some arguments, which gives you another function that you can pass around um, to do that. Okay, so as we said, you know, the function, uh, function um, type operator associates to the right. Um, and now we can also see why that's the case, because if I now apply f here to five, I get a function from int to int to int. So now, let's not do this five, uh, three, two, one. Okay, so let's apply it to three. Now I get a function, then I apply that to two, which I get a function that I can apply to one, and now I get an integer. Okay, so just like type application associates 
to the right, function application associates to the left. So in Haskell, you can leave out these arrows. So you can write F3 to 1, which means apply F to 3, then that to 2, that to 1. So here again, you see that syntax is kind of carefully crafted to match, you know, the type structure and the expression structure. Um, and I know that, you know, um, when, when we talk with Brian, again, you know, this is one of Brian's favorite things too. This kind of the trick to get this notation of for functions uh, really nice. Okay, so as I said, um, if function type constructor for functions associates to the right, the um, application of a function should um, associate to the left. Okay, now um, we talked already about the fact that these type constructors can be over arbitrary values. Um, and in um, C Sharp and VB and Java and Eiffel, uh, that's usually called generics. So a function that you can apply to many values is called generic. So in Haskell, uh, this is called polymorphic. Okay, so when you have a function that's kind of parameterized by a type, in Haskell this is called a polymorphic function. Um, so for example here the function length takes a list of arbitrary type and returns an integer. And so this is how you write it, so, um, and let me put it on the board, so length is a function that takes a list of types for arbitrary a and returns an int, okay? So that's the, the, the way. Really, you know, if you're, if you're precise, and this is not Haskell, but this says, you know, for all a, a arrow int. But, you know, you don't write that for all in, in Haskell. So now let's compare this to C sharp. In C sharp, we would write the same signature as follows. We write, write int length, and I'll, I'll rewrite this as an extension method. So it's length, and now I have to say what is the, the type parameter here, and then we will write, you know, this of list of the source, and it returns an int. So the Haskell type, you know, length, takes a list for arbitrary type A, returns an int, and then here, you know, in C sharp you write like this. So another reason when, you know, I said in the beginning in like, I think it was lecture one, when we explained the kind of syntax of Haskell, the fact that types in Haskell start with an uppercase, and here it starts with a lowercase, that's how we know that this is a type variable. Whereas in C sharp, in order to kind of, you know, there could be a type T, but in order to kind of say that this thing is parameterized over T, you have to give it here so that this T is bound here. So there's kind of a little trick that Haskell uses to kind of avoid writing this extra binding occurrence of that variable A. Okay, and now I can, you know, just like in C sharp, I can apply length to a list of different types, so I can say, you know, give me the length of a um, list of booleans, and I can say, give me the length of a list of integers, and it um, doesn't really matter because, you know, the, the, the length function works on arbitrary list and always returns an integer. That's exactly the same as in C sharp. But the trick here is that, you know, in Haskell, these type variables start with a lowercase letter such that you know that this thing is a, is a polymorphic type. Okay, and now um, just like in C sharp in the, um, the base class libraries, you know, system.collections.generic, in Haskell most of the um, functions in the standard library are also polymorphic or generic. So for example, um, here are a couple of, of examples from the um, uh, prelude, the Haskell prelude. The function first takes a pair of arbitrary types A and B and returns a value of type A. So, you know, what can that function do? Well, it takes a pair and it returns the first element of the pair. Um, the function hat, you know, takes a list of A, returns an A. Well, that could in principle do anything, right? It could return any value of the list, but in this case it returns the first element. Um, the function take, we have seen that in the previous lecture, takes a number, 
um, and then a list and returns a list by you know taking the first uh, n elements. Um, the the fourth function here, zip, is an interesting one. Um, and let's look at it in a little bit more detail. If you look at in in Visual Studio 2010 or in C Sharp 4.0 or in VB, um, what is it, VB 10? Um, we have introduced zip there as well as an operator, as a link sequence operator. Um, and in this case, in Haskell, the type of zip has type list to list to a list of pairs. Okay, so let's write down that type. So zip is a current function that takes a list of A, returns a function that takes a list of B's and then returns a list of pairs of type A and B. Okay? So there's two interesting things going on. First of all, it's a curried function, so it doesn't take a pair of lists, but it takes you know, two lists in a row and then returns a list of pairs. Okay? So a nicer way, I think, to write that function would be like this. So it's a function that takes a pair of lists and returns a list of pairs. So I think that's a kind of nice, nice, um, nicer um, uh, signature. So now let's look at how this thing looks in C sharp. So in C sharp, zip has the following signature, and I'll write the type signatures, the type variables later. So it takes an i enumerable of t. Um, let's call that, you know, x's, and it takes an i numerable of s, that calls that y's, and now it needs to return an i numerable of what? Well, in C sharp, we don't have this notion of pair. So instead of, you know, returning a pair, what we do here, we have a selector function, so we pass here a function of t comma s to R, and let's call that F, and now what we return is we re return an I enumerable of R, and now we write here T S R. Okay, so the, the C sharp signature for the zip function is very related, so it takes a list of T's, which is here I enumerables, a list of S's, which is also an I enumerable, and instead of returning a, a, a list of pairs, since we don't have a pair, we pass a function that will kind of, you know, take the two values and return the result, and then it will return a list of that result. So it's kind of slightly different, and this is a trick that we often use in C Sharp. Since we don't have tuples, whenever we need to return a tuple, or where we would return a tuple in, in Haskell or in a functional language, in C Sharp you pass instead a function which is like the constructor function for a tuple. So instead of passing, you know, like implicitly returning a tuple, you just pass a function that takes a tuple as an argument and will do the, the already kind of reduce that tuple into a value. Um, that's a, a, a small trick that we often use. Now let's kind of talk a little bit about classes in Haskell. So um, when we wrote int, um, Really, that was, um, we were a little bit too specific here. So let's look at another type here. So that's um, sum, which takes a list of things and it returns an A, so a list of A. Now of course sum, you know, cannot be defined for arbitrary types A. What does it mean to kind of, you know, sum a list of functions? But, um, so that's where in C Sharp or VB or Java or in object-oriented languages you use constraints, right? You say, well, I can sum a list of types T if I can, you know, add these elements of type T. And that's the kind of same in Haskell. So in Haskell what you would write is you say, well, I can sum up the elements of a list provided that each, that the values in the list satisfy the num-predicate, and in C-sharp that would mean um, provided that uh, 
they implement the num interface. So the Haskell type classes here, the easiest way to kind of you know um, compare that to C sharp is that this kind of you know implements the um, num interface. Okay, so in Haskell type classes, roughly corresponds to um, interfaces in an, in an object-oriented language. Um, so now I can write, you know, sum of uh, integers. I can write uh, sum of floating point numbers because both integers and floating point numbers both, you know, implement the um, numeric interface. But I cannot um, sum a list of characters, um, which is kind of different than in C sharp, where characters are just small integers. You can cast them here; they're completely a different type. Okay. So Haskell comes with a couple of built-in um, type classes or interfaces. Um, num is the kind of, you know, um, the uh, most interesting one. Um, then we have equality. So, um, you know, in, we have the same in the .NET framework, you know, equatable, there's even a couple of them. And then there's one for order types. That's types for which we have a, a ordering. So if you look at the... Um, Signatures, whenever you use plus, the type of plus has type A, arrow A, arrow A, but not for all A, but only A's that, are, that have the num interface. So another way to look at this is that the plus method is a method in the num interface, and whenever you use a plus, the type inferred for an expression that uses plus requires that um, expression, the result of that expression to be in the num class. And the same with equality. Whenever you use equality, from that constraint there, that is eq of a, it will require that you know that value of the argument is in the uh, eq class. And the same for ort. Okay. So um, let's um, look at some more examples um, and how we do this type um, inference and so on in, in Haskell. So usually when you're kind of, you know, define a function in Haskell, just like in C-sharp, you start by writing down its type, okay? And um, in Haskell that's optional because there's type inference, so you really never have to write down the type. So let's write down a function here, you know, add um, x, y. So what you would do in Haskell is like, you know, I want, I can write down this function and what the compiler probably would infer is that it would say, you know, it has type num of a because I'm using plus um, and now I get an a and an a and I return an a. So this is the kind of, you know, the, the normal way where, you know, you write down the, the um, expression, the function definition, and the compiler infers the type. But often you kind of start the other way around. You write down your type first, and then, you know, this is like first, and otherwise you do this first. So you write down your type first, and you get, you know, an idea of the structure of your code, and then, you know, you write your code. So if you would write down this type, you can learn a lot from that type. You know that it's a function that takes two arguments, and then you know from looking at this thing that it uses, you know, the numeric class. So often it's a good kind of, you know, style, um, programming style to start by writing down your type. The other thing is that even though types are optional, it's good to kind of, you know, give all the types um, that you're using. And, and even if you're not writing down the types, what you can do is you can ask the, you know, the IDE to tell me what is the type of this function definition, and then you cut and paste that type um, on the definition. Um, I, I think this is what probably a lot of people will do in F-sharp um, as well, where, you know, when they write down a function without any type information, you just, you know, um, ask the IDE what is the type, and then you uh, cut and paste it in there. Um, and then the last point is, you know, in Haskell, whenever you have these type constraints, you're using that um, you know, you write it like that. Okay, so here we have a couple of exercises. Um, and again, you know, this is your homework 
for, for, for uh, this week. Um, and le let's look at the first uh, example here. Okay, I'll, I'll walk you through this. Um, because just, you know, playing your own um, type inference, um, you know, implementing the compiler yourself is a good way to, to look at your code. And again, this is as helpful when you're using C Sharp or VB. So if you write the first example, um, you know, A, B, C. Well, by looking at this expression, we see that you're constructing a list. So the type of this thing is list of something. And now I know that there's all characters in there because I know that they all have to be the same type because it's a list. And I see that they're characters, so the type of this thing is type list of character. So again, by kind of inspecting your expressions and playing the compiler yourself, you can get you know a good feeling of how this all all works. And so here's like you know the the, the last one here is interesting. So it's a list of three functions, and now of course all these functions must have the same type. So you can kind of figure out how that works. By the way, um, in C sharp, when you write this, you can this corresponds to array initializers, where you could write something like, you know, and again, in C-sharp you don't have to write the type, but the compiler will infer, because you're using characters here, that the type of this is char array. So you see that, you know, there's a big correspondence to, to the way you write expressions and types in C-sharp and in Haskell. It's all kind of about type inference. And by kind of understanding better how type inference works, you be, will become a better programmer. You kind of get more grip on your code. Um, so there's a, a couple of more exercises here where we give functions, so not types of um, expressions, but you know, a couple of functions. And again, uh, I would really uh, urge you to kind of, you know, install hugs or GHCI and kind of play around and see how the compiler, you know, infers these types for you. Um, and then, you know, you don't have to write them down yourself. Uh, the same, you can install F sharp. F sharp has a very similar um, type inference mechanism. And then just for fun, write these functions in C sharp as well and see, you know, what are the types that you have to write down there. So that was, this, was it for today. Um, you know, we're kind of making our first little steps into writing some actual programs. And I, I hope you've seen how, you know, a lot of the ideas of functional programming, type inference, um, lists, tuples, and so on, are making their way in, in you know, more mainstream languages. Um, and one of the things here is the uh, um, type classes. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in future uh, lectures where I will make the connection with uh, interfaces more precise. So thank you very much. Um, you know, make your exercises, um, be active on the forums, and we'll see you next time. Thanks you, thank you very much.